Hi, how you doing? I'm uh, Paul Coco and I'm going to share with you the second installment of um, my design research project that I did over at NC State. Um, thanks for the uh, response for the uh, first one. I know a lot of people want to see a copy of my uh, paper. Um, trying to figure out what's the best way to put a uh, PDF up. Um, it's either going to be on uh, flight tests or on RC groups. So uh, stay tuned with that. I'll go ahead and post it up when I'm done with uh, all these installments. Um, if you have any specific questions, feel free to contact me. I know that some of you guys are out there doing your uh, own research and um, I'd like to probably know some more insight of uh, what I did here. So today I'm going to talk about the, uh, the f dynamics uh, of uh, how this works and also kind of more go into the, uh, air, uh, the aerospace section to where, you know, we talked about its in-flight performance and, uh, you know, how it performs. All right, so with any type of design project, you want to go ahead and uh, look and see, you know, what your restraints are. So basically, I wanted to make essentially a drone that I could use for FPV flying, which is also, you know, fast and versatile as well. So I kind of wanted the best of both worlds. Um, so that's how I designed it. So I took into consideration, you know, the stability, the design, and also, a, you know, a speed and performance aspect of it. So in order to uh, figure out the dynamics, um, basically this was modeled after the uh, as a rigid body. So you use the rigid body equations of motions, which you can get from any first or second year aerodynamics book. And um, this is basically the genesis of what feeds into the calculations that people do in order to develop their code. So from that free body diagram, you come up with these various different equations. You have your force equations, momentum equations, your angular velocities, and then your, you know, your various Euler angles and Euler rates. Now, um, these basically look for inputs through your gyro and your accelerometer, and then there's basically a error code that tries to achieve a zero error and changes the orientation of your multi-copter in order to achieve that zero part. Now recently for uh, you KK2 users out there, I know that they um, rewrote the code and I believe it's either version 4 and above to actually use uh, Euler angles and Euler rates in order to um, perfect the auto level feature uh, based off the accelerometers. So again, this is basically when you're talking about the code uh, more or less where you know the very very basics of it come from now obviously there's a lot more to it but this is basically what it's doing so some people have asked uh, at various different forums that you know they started their tricopter and they notice that their tail rotor always starts off at an angle and the reason for this is if you look at the force balance you have you know and this is looking at the tail rotor from behind you have some type of uh, torque force that you have to, to overcome which basically goes this way and then some type of rotor force so by going at an angle you have a resultant force going up but you're going in a direction counter to this direction to where you can basically essentially balance this out at an angle now obviously as your rpms increase you're creating more lift your rotor thrust also increases your alpha gets bigger and also because your for torque gets bigger. So that is essentially what is going on with your tail rotor when you see it moving back and forth, when you're not putting any type of yaw control in it. And it's just purely responding to uh, rotor RPMs. All right, um, your two forward ones obviously don't have this feature because they're counter rotating. So the uh, resultant uh, torque force cancels out. So you only have to uh, worry about the upward thrust, which is a good thing if you want to fly. So, um, start off the motor. The motor's, uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Again, you want these motors synchronized. Uh, your synchronization should be less than about 2,500 RPM. So, your motors are all uh, functioning within unison to become as level as possible. The next big thing that you need to worry about would be the propellers. Now with your propellers, um, I noticed that a lot of people are using about eight or 10 inch diameters and very low pitch, about 4.7 to, to five uh, pitch. Now, this is great if you're using a, uh, um, a quadcopter, but for a tricopter, 
it doesn't give you the amount of kick that you want. And I think a lot of people are probably a little bit turned off by tricopters because they don't seem to have as much power using the same gear and the propeller that you would use in a quadcopter. Uh, for my design project, I ended up using a, a 10.8. Um, if you look at some of the calculations out there that they have, the uh, I guess the E calculator that they have, I put in that you know that type of propeller and it said it, technically it wouldn't fly with it because I would be in stall. Yeah, I realized that you know there, I'm sure there's some you know fudge space for some of these calculations. But for the most part, um, you know, uh, I was actually, actually able to get some pretty good results and actually was able to top out at a higher speed. Another resource you can use is your uh, different propeller databases. University of Illinois has a really, really good one. Let me go ahead and uh, bring it up right over here. So basically, I have a complete database of uh, various different model airplane propellers that they've uh, tested, and they've tested them statically in, in a wind tunnel and come up with various different curves and you know, for your thrust coefficient, torque coefficients at various advancing ratios and RPMs, which could help you, you know, determine what might be the, the right one for you. Again, with a large diameter propeller, you have less uh, and less pitch, you have more thrust and less top speed. With a smaller diameter, you have more pitch, less thrust, but more top speed. So you know, keep that into configuration or into consideration. Um, typically, you're looking at a sports airplane that to be about a one to two ratio to one to one. Again, um, a couple things you have to worry about: too big of a pitch becomes an efficient forward flight at high RPMs. Um, a lot of the uh, um, problems with this that uh, you know you could overpower your motor so again in selecting this make sure you figure out which is the best to use now in order to calculate the type of thrust that you're looking at I did uh, some experimentation of what works best so typically for a RC airplane you know for sports a one-to-one -one for thrust to weight ratio is typically good uh, doesn't really work too well for a tricopter or multi-copter it just gets you right out of uh, right in ground effect so you ain't going to be lifting much than a couple inches off the fl uh, off the ground uh, two to one gets you in light wind and to get you the performance which um, you would probably want for this type of design project I tried to get as close to three to one uh, th so three times the thrust for the, the given weight that the uh, motors can produce in order to uh, get this thing flying the way I wanted to. I can't, I think when everything was said and done it came out to be 2.85 which for me was close enough and worked out. But when you're designing it make sure you try to maximize that number. Alright so looking at a 9, nine by 4.7 uh, propeller which is basically what most of you guys are using um, you're gonna generate about 10,000 grams or sorry 1100 grams of thrust at 10,000 rpm which gives you a Pitch speed about 41 miles per hour. A 10.8, you can generate 11,000 or 1,100 grams at a thrust of 8,000 RPM, which gives you a pitch speed of about 45 uh, miles per hour. Now, um, realize that your pitch speed is kind of like an arbitrary number, but it shows that the 10.8 will give you slightly lesser RPMs, and it will give you a, a faster speed. So. You know, maybe not going with the nine four point seven would be the best. Now, I would deter I would imagine if I probably put a uh, ten eight on a uh, quadcopter, it would probably you know f just blast off into space, uh, trying to do a uh, full power uh, takeoff. But um, I know a lot of people are using it, so that's my justification for using a significantly higher pitch than what most people are using nowadays. All right, here's uh, some published graphs that show the relationship between thrust and uh, drag. All right, so obviously where you're dragging your thrust meet, that's basically where your top speed is going to be. And you can see as close as you can get to a one-to-one -one ratio, that gives you the highest uh, top speed. All right, so going real quick into the uh, aerodynamics of this, I wanted to go ahead and look at essentially what... All right, this is last video. Essentially, the two different kinds of configurations that this works in. So this is going to work in a hover, and it's going to work in forward flight. Now, obviously, that's the unique principle of having one of these um, tricopters, multicopters, the fact that you have, you know, the option to hover, to loiter, to take video, whatever. But you also want to, you know, 
proceed forward at you know a pretty decent speed so I looked at both of those aspects so for hover I looked at the efficiencies based off of the number of blades that you might have so the most efficient propeller blade would be a, a one bladed propeller but you know that's not practical in most cases so two bladed propellers would be the most efficient that you could have followed by three and then four so here we have uh, again from uh, your basic, uh, in this case it's a V-Stall aerodynamics book. We're going to use uh, momentum theory and disk theory in order to determine you know, the various different equations and how these efficiencies uh, come out and then actually apply them to a wind tunnel. So here are some of the equations that we have here. Alright, we come up with a modified momentum theory which gives us an empirical value of K which is basically our, our loss values. And the losses that you have are going to be about 30% due to uh, profile drag, 6% to non-uniform flow, strip, strip steam rotation about 0.2, and tip loss is going to be 3. So your average, average or so, you know, uh, real operating propeller is typically about 83 for a model RC airplane. There's, their propellers are significantly less. You're talking about a really good propeller if you can get it up to 60, but typically it's uh, far less than that. So basically I had a, a wind tunnel set up where I had the same pitch and diameter varying the different amount of blades and I calculated that value of K. And I determined that that value of K is basically reflected upon the amount of uh, efficiencies or drags that, that that might have there. And I concluded that the two blade propeller had the lowest value of K followed by the uh, three, uh, three bladed, or followed by the three and then the four blade propeller obviously. Um, Increased efficiency means uh, less losses, more time the tricopter can remain on station, increases enduring time. The four bladed uh, had K values almost double that at two, but produced almost double the thrust for the given RPM. So if you're in one of those crazy uh, competitions like the Hobby King Bear Lift, you probably want to go with the four bladed propeller, but in this case, I decided to go with the, uh, the two bladed propeller. Now, you might say that if you are generating, you know, double the payload, then, you know, isn't this a good thing? Well, technically, yeah, when it comes down to it, you're not really getting double because when you have to upgrade, you know, the motors and the uh, ESCs and the battery in order to facilitate that, although you might think that you're getting a 100% increase in payload, you're technically only getting around 30% due to the upgraded uh, powertrain. So keep that in mind if you decide to go for a uh, more than a two-bladed propeller when you're, you're making these. All right, the next thing is the uh, forward flight. Forward flight, I basically looked at um, what exactly would my, my limiting factors. For any propeller, you have incompressible effects at the tips, which basically means that as the tips approach the speed of sound, you have like little uh, shock waves that will violently shake your uh, the tips of your propeller, so that's basically how fast you could spin it. And then forward flight, you have a phenomenon called uh, tip speed stall which you know showcase over here so that occurs on the retreating end so as your blade is spinning in within this direction you developed uh, your retreating uh, as you're moving forward your advancing blade is actually moving slightly faster because you actually have that forward speed with you and then your retreating blade is going to be moving at the speed as the whole entire rotor head at the given uh, length that you're at minus the speed that you're going forward which is going to develop a negative lift or a law or like a void right over here when that gets big enough you're basically going to stall so the phenomenon that you see in tricopters and quadcopters is that as you're going really fast forward and especially on the smaller ones where you might be able to get more power out of your motor at the, per uh, given speed um, but as you're going in forward flight, unless you reach a point to where all of a sudden the tail just drops and then you're basically doing a complete 180 and flying backwards. So a couple things that lead to this, uh, high gross weight, high airspeed, low rotor speed, high density, steep turns. So you might see this if you like to yank and bank really hard on your tricopters or your quadcopters. So in this situation, I made a 50% uh, scale model, basically a smaller tricopter. Looked at what the profile looked like, um, you know, at uh, you know at a hover, and then then I had my uh, different sensors which recorded the onboard speed of the tricopter, which this occurred, which I assumed to be at max speed on a calm day, 
and determined that this was basically the profile that I was looking at as I was at approximately 24 knots when this occurred at the given um, RPM in uh, radians per second. So then I basically extrapolated, you know, the, the length of the bubble and then uh, put it onto my 10H uh, diameter propeller blade and determined that my max speed is going to be a prop approximately about 46.9 knots, which basically occurs at about 54 miles per hour. Now, with the various different tests that I did, I was actually able to get this in the uh, about 47 to 48 miles per hour. Typically, people can get these tricopters designed probably around, I don't know, the high 30s, low 40s. So this was, uh, you know, pretty good for me that I know where my upwards limit would be. So, um, so we have that there. Other things that you want to take into consideration as well is going to be the uh, the shape that your rotor arms are. So obviously you have different diag coefficients, whether you're using a um, a tube which gives you a spherical cross section or or yeah, spherical cross section. Um, you have a square or a, or a cube or a diamond, which is basically you know your um, your square tubes that you have, and then you have an airfoil. So ideally, you would probably want these to be airfoil uh, by nature, but you know it's pretty hard considering that you're always changing orientation. That you would always have to change that airfoil orientation to meet the direction and the attitude that you're flying in. So if you're going to make one of these, you probably want to want to use uh, you know tubes in order to uh, limit your drag. Overall, what does this do to you? It might give you an extra, you know, two or three mile per hour uh, top speed. But, you know, every little bit counts. All right, so, you know, this probably wasn't as exciting as the first one. So um, I decided to include on my part three the video of uh, my flight that I did, uh, basically the uh, full advanced prototype, which does not include the all the sensors and the board. So I used a modified uh, um, KK blackboard with just only the gyros. And basically, I just, you know, completely drove that thing like I stole it. So I tried to do all kinds of uh, high power maneuvers just to see where the edge of the envelope is. So hope you enjoyed this one, but I hope you definitely enjoy the next one. Um, and I guess I'll uh, talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Bye.